Hello, I'm Tom Stapledon, and I've got another talk on behalf of the Friends of Williamson's Tunnels here. Uh, this time I'm going to talk about a man called Samuel Jones. I'll be bringing in another important character in this little story in a while, but uh, we'll kick off with Mr. Jones, who uh, at one time was an occupier of Joseph Williamson's own house in Mason Street, Edge Hill. A little bit of background. We start up here at the top of Paddington. Many of you will have seen others in this series of talks, and I very often show this painting. This is the top end of a street called Paddington in Edge Hill, where Joseph Williamson put up this set of four tall commercial buildings around the time of 1836 to 1840. Uh, just here, between the tall buildings and the next house, is the entrance to a very small street known as uh, Back Mason Street in those days. And that's what it looked like in um, much later, actually, in 1934. Um, the area had built up quite substantially. The old houses had been knocked down and more um, shops were built all the way down Paddington. It became quite a busy thoroughfare and, uh, and the shopping street. Um, but then by 1934, the time of this photograph it was starting to go downhill quite badly again and um, the reason I'm showing this is um, this building here is the first of the Williamson block number 120 Paddington and um, the one on the other side of the street um, is number 118 Paddington we know that because the the number is there on the shop front window number 118 Paddington turns out to have been um, occupied uh, in 1911 by a uh, Mr. Samuel Jones. And this appears in uh, one of the street directories at the time, and he used the building as a second-hand machinery store. Um, we, we have picked up the information that Mr. Samuel Jones was a retired mining engineer, but he, he had a hobby of collecting machinery, buying and selling machinery. And so this is what he did after his retirement. We don't know how long he was there. We know he was there in 1911, occupying this building. And uh, at some future date, he moved around the corner down to Mason Street. This is a painting of Mason Street in um, um, about 1858, I believe. Mr. Herdman, the uh, local artist, was painting his watercolours all around the street. Uh, and uh, this is all we have to go on. Uh, but presumably these houses built by Joseph Williamson look very much as they did uh, in his day. But of course, he had died in 1840. This is Joseph Williamson's own house here with the arched front, which eventually became number 40 stroke 42 Mason Street. And the building next coming down the street here, set back slightly, is number 44 Mason Street. And it seems that um, a few years later, uh, number 40 to 44 Mason Street were occupied by Mr. Samuel Jones. Maybe he decided he needed bigger premises for the um, machinery he was storing and buying and selling. But we don't actually know when he moved down here. <clears throat> but he was definitely here before 1920. That I can be sure of. Now, in the years that followed, um, as it looked in Williamson's day, the street did go downhill quite badly. By uh, 1916, when this photograph was taken, looking up the street from uh, here's the railway bridge over the uh, railway cutting, um, the shops, uh, sorry, the uh, houses that Williamson had built were no longer occupied by the gentry, the rich merchants uh, who had occupied them in his day, but they'd gone downhill quite seriously. This and number uh, 52, I think, or 50, had become uh, a clothing factory. The name Zeff up there over the top. Uh, I think they were an underwear factory. Uh, Mr. Williamson's house is up there, a bit higher up the street. And uh, the whole neighbourhood had gone downhill. The other side of the road was full of slum housing um, and the courts. And uh, this uh, is the only photograph I've ever seen, uh, I feel quite lucky to have it, of number 44 Mason Street. It shows Williamson's house, just the edge of it there, with those three windows facing down the street. But this is number 44. You may or may not be able to read it, but that sign over the front door there does say machinery stores. 
So we know that that was what was occupied by Mr. Samuel Jones a little later after he moved down from uh, Paddington. This had been occupied by uh, many people after Williamson's death. Um, I've gone through all this in uh, several of my previous talks. Um, but the last occupiers before Mr. Uh, Mr. Jones came here were the Territorial Army. They'd occupied number 44 as a storeroom. They'd occupied number 4042, Williamson's house, as a barracks with a parade ground behind. But eventually uh, they moved on. And in fact, they moved next door. The Territory Army had built a new purpose-built barracks here, just slightly up the street. Uh, Williamson's house is just off to the left of this photo. And um, all of the territorial units moved over and occupied this building with a big drill hall behind it. I'm going through this in uh, in uh, date order, coming up to date, and then I'm going to go back to where I wanted to be later. So uh, moving up to the 1990s now, um, this aerial photo shows the frontage of Joseph Williamson's house, two stories worth of what was a three-story Georgian house, and that's all remained after 1936 when Samuel Jones, who at the end of 1935 sold up the premises to a garage company called PM Willie and Sons. And they immediately demolished the whole lot. They demolished all of number 44 and they demolished all of number 4042, Williamson's house, apart from that piece of the frontage. They left that standing for some reason. And uh, a couple of bits of the two side walls of the properties. A lot of it was just um, uh, demolished and uh, sent down below and concreted over. And they built these... Um, modern for the day, um, steel-framed asbestos roof buildings that uh, eventually stretched all the way to the back of the plot. Not all in one go, but by 1949, they had definitely covered the whole plot uh, with those modern buildings. Um, they vacated sometime in the 1970s, and then another company called T. Hill uh, moved in, and uh, they may have been motor engineers to start off with, but they eventually specialised in tyres, I believe, and at the time of this photo, they had vacated sometime in the mid-1990s and their buildings became derelict uh, until they were finally pulled down by Liverpool City Council in 1999 because they had um, acquired the land. And this is all we have left today from 1999 onwards. This is what we call our headquarters, the Williamson House site, the frontage of number 4042. And I would imagine... I don't believe that in Williamson's day, this was uh, a drive-in entrance. I still can't believe that because there were definitely steps in front of here and a smaller door inset in this by the look of it. I think in later years, especially when the garage people took over, it will have become a vehicle entrance. And then uh, later on in um, the army's days and in uh, Mr. Samuel Jones's days, um, this would have been the main entrance because the little front door that you saw in an earlier photograph of number 44 was far too small to be the only entrance for a machinery store. <clears throat> and we're led to believe that he was dealing in some quite large pieces of equipment. So that's all we have left now. Now I'm backtracking to uh, 1926 here. This man is uh, Charles Hand, local historian who I've spoken about many times before. The man who, as a, a member of the Historic Society of Lancashire and Cheshire, with a very great interest in Joseph Williamson and his underground world, did a lot of research uh, in the uh, early years of the uh, 20th century. And in 1926, it was he who, after uh, written a paper on Joseph Williamson and read it to the members of the Historic Society, uh, took a group of them on a visit to the um, Williamson buildings on Paddington and the cellars below. And this has been well reported and photographs appeared in the uh, local paper. And um, the, the write-up of that uh, visit um, in the Liverpool Daily Post in November two, uh, 1926 is what led us to rediscover the Paddington, Paddington cellars uh, years later in 1999. But it's uh, rather less well known that the very Saturday after that visit to the Paddington Cellars, Mr. Hand took his party, maybe the same people, maybe not all the same, to explore underneath Joseph Williamson's house. 
Now, Mr. Hand was a friend of Samuel Jones. They obviously had a shared interest in uh, everything to do with Joseph Williamson. And Samuel Jones, of course, was occupying Mr. Williamson's own house. And he was in the habit of exploring underground and very much liked um, the, the Williamson uh, uh, structures below ground. So the two of them were great friends. And it wouldn't have been any problem at all for Mr. Hand to get permission to uh, visit um, Mr. Jones's premises and to go down below with a group from the Historic Society. <clears throat> and this is the only photograph I've got of that visit. Very poor quality photograph. Remember, this chamber would have been absolutely pitch black. It's a, it's a really large chamber. We call it the Banqueting Hall, as uh, most people now know. And um, above here, behind these gentlemen, this is what we call the gash, the long, deep, narrow passage that we have to climb down to get into the banqueting hall. And they come out here. They're standing at the mouth of the gash at the entrance to the banqueting hall and another gentleman standing off to the side. And you can see that already at that time in 1926, <clears throat> there are piles of rubble on the floor. So people had already started to... Uh, backfill this with all the detritus and rubbish. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this was in November 1926. And uh, it's a rather interesting little story has come up. Um, I'm going to read this page. This is uh, from Charles Hand's manuscript, which was published in the Journal of the Historic Society. And he says here, a few months ago, the news came to my ears that a photograph of Mr. Williamson had been found under rather romantic circumstances by Mr. Samuel Jones, present owner of the house in which Williamson resided last. Mr. Jones kindly allowed me to see the likeness and furnished me with the particulars of its discovery. It's a tinted framed photograph on glass measuring eight and a half by six and a half inches. There is nothing about it to indicate the personality of the sitter but that it is Mr. Joseph Williamson, all must agree. We know that Mr. Williamson was a tall, portly, dignified and handsome man, and on this particular occasion he elected to be represented as Mr. Stonehouse described him in his manuscript. His hat was what might be called truly a shocking bad one, <laughs> and he generally wore an old and very much patched brown coat, corduroy breeches and thick slovenly shoes. This picture Mr. Jones found a short time ago in a pocket under the flooring boards in a corner of one of the rooms on the first story. Accompanying it was the photograph of a lady, almost of a certainty, Mrs. Williamson, exactly similar in style, size and framing, but unfortunately very much damaged. Mr. Jones thinks he may have broken the photograph when ferreting about this pocket with a long stick at the time of his discovery. It seems that this pocket under the floorboards was a, a space about three foot by four foot and 12 inches high, which had been built into the fabric of the building, probably for storing value, hiding valuables. And uh, these two photographs appear to have been in there. So he was poking around with a stick, trying to see if there's anything in there and fished out these two photos. Now, we have no reason to doubt that that story is true. Uh, I think Mr. Uh, Jones was a... Uh, a straightforward man who wouldn't have um, uh, done anything underhand. But unfortunately, this story is fictitious. We latched on to this uh, story and assumed that this was Joseph Williamson and this was his wife for, for many years. But eventually we realised there is absolutely no way this could be true. Joseph Williamson died at the age of 71 in 1840. There's no possibility that photography had reached the stage where a sitter sitting in a chair could be photographed uh, um, and produce a photograph of this kind of quality by 1840. No way at all. As for the supposedly Mrs. Williamson, she died in 1822. Absolutely no possibility that she could have been photographed in 1822. So it looks as if somebody, and we don't know who, has performed an elaborate hoax here. They've known what they thought Joseph Williamson looked like 
from the way James Stonehouse had written about him, and they posed this picture. But it's total fake. The question is, who would do such a thing and why? It's going to remain a mystery, I'm afraid, but uh, it's an interesting little story. Going back to um, this photo for a moment, this is number 44 Mason Street, the entrance to Mr. Sam Jones's works where he kept his uh, machinery, machinery store written over the door, number 4042 next door. So I'm leading on now to a story about another gentleman who's also associated with Samuel Jones. And this is a story that only came up very recently. Um, what happened was a lady called Linda Curran contacted the Friends of Williamson's Tunnels on the 30th of August, 2022, inquiring about joining a tour of the house site on Heritage Open Days on the 17th of September. And she was going to be coming down by rail. She writes, my father, Jim Curran, born 1915, lived at 8 Mason Street and later wrote about entering the tunnels beneath the Williamson house, aged about five, with his father, Thomas Curran, a friend of the then owner, Mr. Sam Jones. Sam Jones was a retired mining engineer who lived in a large house near the Picton Clock. He used Mason Street for storing items of heavy machinery, indulging his hobby of buying and selling second-hand machinery. He and my grandfather shared a mutual interest in engineering, especially steam engine power. Now, we booked Linda Curran in for a tour of the house site um, during uh, Heritage Open Days in the uh, September 2022. And uh, I got quite excited that she might have some interesting uh, bits of information or anecdotes um, that could be uh, helpful to us or at least interesting to us. And so I, I made sure that um, I took the tour um, that Linda Curran was um, due to be on, and I wanted to pick her brains. Now, um, she had not only uh, told us about her father and her grandfather, and uh, the association with Mason Street. But when she actually came on that day, she brought along with her a very interesting letter that had been written by her father, which is really by way of a, a very useful memoir, uh, a first-hand account of going down into the tunnels. So what happened was, um, Jim Curran, at the age of uh, 80, 80 plus had been sent a copy of this um, news sheet. It's not a newspaper, but uh, a newsletter called the Halewood Community News. The reason was that um, his nephew had sent it to him because it contained an article about the exploits of the nephew's daughter, who was a, a young girl who turned out to be an absolute... Uh, uh, golfing whiz and she'd been invited over to the United States to play as an 11 year old girl I think and so this story uh, appeared on the front page of the Halewood Community News and this is her I don't know what oh, I can't remember what her name was um, but she's there being photographed so that's why this paper was sent to uh, Jim Curran um, for his interest but while he had this paper he looked through and leafed through it, and he found an article inside about Joseph Williamson. And when he read this, <laughs> he he seems to have rather taken exception to it in some respects. He didn't really like what he was reading, and he didn't think it was um, he didn't think it was very good. So he decided that he would write a letter to the editor of the Halewood Community News in response to this article that he had read. And uh, I think the easiest thing is if I if I read this letter to you in his own words, because uh, it's it's an interesting read. So um, excuse me for just reading it word for word. But uh, dear editor, this is in March 2003. I have just received a copy of Halewood Community News from my nephew, Mr. Ken Goddard, with your article on the achievements of Emma Goddard. Of interest to me also was the article on the mole of Edge Hill, 
of whom many fanciful stories have recently been written, without, I fear, any substance in fact. Over 80 years ago, I was probably the only child ever to have played in the chambers beneath the house of Williamson in Mason Street. I wonder if my little wooden cart made from a box and four old pram wheels is still there. I was born at 8 Mason Street on the 18th of December, 1915. He now goes on to describe a lot of the people who lived in the street, a lot of the houses and the businesses. And he obviously has a fantastic memory still uh, at the age of over 80. So he writes, on the Paddington corner was Mrs. Graham, newspaper and sweet shop. Then the entry, then about 15 or so, two up, two down houses. The Kaminsky's, Catterall's, Our Home, Swain's, Armstrong, Bew's, Holmes and others. Next came the barracks, a comparatively new building with Mr. Pearson, the caretaker's house. Then came the somewhat decaying Williamson house with its imposing entry steps and door and grand staircase inside. There was Mrs. Munce's shirt factory, J.B. Johnson architectural plaster products factory, the railway cutting, the sweet factory and the pub. From Paddington on the other side came the corner pub. Three big three-storey houses, the middle one occupied by the Siner family, coal merchants, then a yard stretching back to the top of Paddington and a court of about ten houses. Then two houses, a back entry to another house, another court of ten houses or so, and a long garden stretching back the length of the court to a big house with fronting the street what had obviously been stabling for horse and carriage, but was now used as a coal yard by Mr Parker. Then came a high wall opposite the barracks, enclosing a huge yard. Next came the brickfield, a big open space opposite Williamson's, on which an estate of council houses was later built. The owner of the Williamson house was Mr Sam Jones, a retired mining engineer. He lived with his wife in a big house in Sandown Park, near the Picton Clock in uh, Wavertree. And he used Mason Street for storing items of heavy machinery, indulging his hobby of buying and selling second-hand machinery. He and my father were close friends because of their mutual interest in engineering, especially steam engine power. My father used to make model steam engines and use them to power model ships of about three feet length, which we sailed on Wavertree Park Lake. Mr. Jones came to Mason Street almost every day and came to us for a meal at lunchtime, for which he always insisted on paying my mother. Many is the penny or tuppence, and sometimes even sixpence, which he gave me. When we went to his home, Mrs. Jones would give me treats of cakes, scones and sweets, and she would play music on her big church organ. At that time, I think that the people of the area were totally unaware of what was below the house, and there was never any mention of Williamson or the tunnels. Mr. Jones was a quiet, private person, and neither he nor my father ever spoke of it. When I was about five years old, I remember my father taking me to the house where I played on the big staircase and on the big pieces of machinery in the big rooms on the ground floor, while my father and Mr. Jones did what they had to do. A little later, I went below for the first time. My father took me down to the house one day, and he and Mr. Jones wanted to go below. They could not leave me alone, so they took me with them. There was no lighting, no such thing as electricity, so they had oil lamps. We went to the back of the ground floor room, through a door and down steps to a cellar, through another door, down more steps, and then down a slope, which led into a big cave, which to a little boy seemed immense. Now this would be the banqueting hall as we know it now. The description is exactly right. There were two big, bright arc lights set up to light up the cave. Here I was left in safety to play with my cart and toys while they went off to explore or whatever. After that, I often went down with them to my own private playground. Later they took me with them into the second big cave and down the main passage with a few short passages branching off. This main passage led down to the corporation yard in Smithdown Lane. The exit into the yard was securely blocked off, for security reasons, I suppose. 
I'm sure the people who worked in the yard had no knowledge of this passage. What my father and Mr. Jones ever discovered down there, I never knew. Whether there's any concrete evidence of Williamson's affairs, such as letters, account books, etc., I do not know. It's only in later years the fanciful stories about Williamson's philanthropy, banquets in the cave, tunnels from the house to St. Mary's Church, etc., abound none of which I fear can be authenticated. Probably the visit, vivid ima inventive imagination of some journalist searching for something to write about. Hence such headlines as the Mole of Edge Hill and the King of Edge Hill. St Mary's was dedicated in 1813. It's most doubtful that Williamson ever worshipped there. As for the banquets down below, why should a man with a sumptuous, warm, comfortable home wish to wine and dine his friends in a cold cave. As for a tunnel from house to church, a study of the deep sewerage system would rule that out. I understand that the passage from yard to house has been opened up as a tourist attraction. I've recently been seriously ill, but when I am fit enough, I hope to be able to visit my old play area. I feel that I will only find what was there over 80 years ago. The passage or tunnel with its few short offshoots and the two caverns. I cannot believe that Edge Hill is honeycombed with tunnels. The main passage and caverns were probably the result of earlier quarrying for sandstone and were trying to be adapted by Williamson as warehousing for the commodities that he dealt in. Perhaps he succeeded, perhaps he did not, but I'm loath to believe that he tunneled all over Edge Hill just to give work to the unemployed. Like all the entrepreneur merchants of Liverpool of that period, he would have been a hard-nosed businessman with a keen sense of the value of his money. Of course, there would be survey exploration borings and ventilation shafts in the area of the railway cutting from Edge Hill to Lime Street. Finally, I am amused by the whimsical tale of the man and his bottling business. That was the Sarsaparilla shop or bar at the top of Paddington by Harold Lomax Chemists. Nothing mysterious or sinister about young and old sitting in comfort and enjoying their dandelion and burdock. And that's written by James Curran in uh, 2003. So um, I have to say that um, I find Mr. Curran's um, writing incredibly accurate. A lot of the uh, the people and the businesses that he mentions in Mason Street are uh, exactly right. And he obviously did have a fantastic memory, but unfortunately there is a slip up somewhere, uh, uh, a lapse in his memory about one item, because when he talks about going into a second cave and down a passage that comes out to the uh, um, corporation yard in Smith Down Lane, that is not possible. Um, I think he's missed out a little bit in his memory. To have got down there, he he would have had to have entered from another property further down the street on the other side of the railway cutting because between the stable yard and the Williamson house, there is the Edge Hill to Lime Street railway cutting, which is 70 or 80 feet deep as it passes through this land. Uh, there's no way they went underneath the railway cutting. So they must have entered via another property or possibly um a way in in a garden or something like that that led them down uh through the back of the um double tunnel or the corner tunnel at the williamson tunnels heritage center as it is now and he's writing at a time when that had just been opened up you see uh, as a tourist attraction around 2002 so um that's the only lapse i can see but other than that he seems to have got it very right he um, obviously did take exception to the article he wrote. And at the time, um, I didn't know um, exactly what the problem was. But since then, I've managed to uh, get a little bit more from Linda Curran. She told me that she had the, this copy of the Halewood Community News, and she told me she also thought she had some old photographs of her father. And just a few weeks ago, uh, she came up with them. Uh, I was so lucky to get these. And um, this she supplied me with is wonderful. 
it doesn't actually go right back to uh, Jim Curran as a five-year-old boy with his father, of course. I would say he's probably near a 15 in this photograph. And this is in the, uh, I believe it's in the backyard of their house at number eight, Mason Street. And he's standing behind a model boat, one of the boats that his father built. Now, isn't that nice to have? And then this one, there were a few others as well, but nothing showing very much of Mason Street. This is Jim Curran as a fairly young boy. People look much older than they did in those days. He's a, he's a young teenager, I would say. And this is his father, Thomas Curran. And uh, with one of these model boats, uh, it doesn't actually say that this is in Wavertree Park, but this probably is Wavertree Park. And this is where they were sailing these uh, model boats with uh, steam engines. What a nice thing to find. It really brings um, the history to life, I think. And um, finally, that's Jim Curran, uh, as he looked in the uh, in around 2003, I think. And uh, it's nice to put a face to the uh, the writing of Jim Curran. Uh, one one last thing: um, when I finally got a copy of the article that he was responding to, that was. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that was an interesting moment because when I saw this article and read it um, and saw the name at the bottom, I knew exactly what Mr. Curran's problem was. It turned out to be an article which uh, had been published by the Harewood Community News, and it was taken from a book by um, a man called Richard Whittington Egan. Richard Whittington Egan was a man who made himself out to be a historian. But really, he wrote in such a fanciful, whimsical way, and he didn't care too much about facts at all. All he was interested in was a good story. And he got lots of things wrong. And um, he, he really exaggerated stories or just went by other people's writings and didn't do any research himself. So... I'm not at all surprised that Mr. Curran took objection to uh, what he read, as I do to anything written by Richard Whittington Egan. But that's another story. So that's about it. That's all I've got to show you. I hope you uh, found that interesting. So thank you very much for watching. <laughs>